like victory. Welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm Tim Farmer. Tonight we have a special half hour show all about raptors in Kentucky. What's a raptor? We're going to find out in just a minute. To my left, Kate Slankard, avian biologist. Thanks for being here. To her left, Jeff Roberts, conservation educator and multimillionaire, right? <laughs> that's right. That's exactly right. She's a millionaire too, but that's a long story. You know what? Tonight we have so many questions uh, about raptors. People see them all the time. They see probably more than they used to, which is a good thing. And we actually have some in hand in the house tonight. So we're going to actually see some, but we're going to answer a bunch of questions off of Facebook about raptors. First of all, I'm going to ask you, how did you get involved in the bird world? What, what drew you to that? Well, it was something that just always fascinated me as a kid. I was always um, looking at birds in my backyard and was, uh, I guess, maybe a teenager when I figured out this was something you could do for a living. And as soon as I learned that, that was it for me. You know, that was That's what I was going to do. I, yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. And I have seen you at the Salado Center with birds in hand. What drew you to nature in general? The same. I had the fortune of being introduced to the great outdoors and Kentucky's wildlife from a young age. And I uh, fondly remember birding trips with my uh, papa and, uh, you know, just fell in love with it from an early age and, and very similar. Once I realized that this is something that I could do as a career, uh, you know, the rest was history. You know, I remember uh, going out with my parents and grandparents. My, my grandfather had the old names. He'd see a, he'd see a bird and he'd say, there's a B. Martin. You remember those names? Mm -hmm. Is it actually a B. Martin? Well, Kate would probably Kate? be able to tell you better than I would. You know what I'm talking about? I, I think they may eat more other insects more than bees. Are you talking about purple martins, I assume? Or? He, it, was, it had black and white on it. He called it a bee martin. Yeah. All right, back okay. to the raptors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's take a quick question here from Eugene Beasley. Now, they got on the Kentucky Field Facebook page and asked these questions. And there's a lot of raptors in Kentucky, but this is kind of a general uh, question. How long do raptors live? Well, it depends on the species. Um, we have a wide variety of raptors in Kentucky, and we're going to talk about a lot of them today. But um, we have species that are relatively short-lived, like the barn owl that's lucky to live 10 years or so, which is short for a raptor. Um, and uh, then we have species that live a long, long time, like the bald eagle, that it's not unusual for them to live 25 years oh, wow. in the wild. All right, I guess we should back up a little bit. We assume everybody knows what a raptor is, but in case they don't, what is a raptor? Well, raptor comes from the Latin root word that means to seize and carry away. And it's really a name that we use to describe uh, a few different groups of, of what most people would consider to be birds of prey. These are uh, animals that are equipped with certain characteristics that allow them to hunt, kill, and eat other animals. Uh, talons, uh, typically strong, a lot of times hooked beaks, really good eyesight. So in Kentucky, when we say raptor, we're talking about owls, falcons, hawks, and eagles. Okay, James Holman wants to know what's the difference among the raptors and are any endangered? Well, different raptors are built for whatever type of um, prey they tend to take. And so we have um, the falcons that are built to be fast flyers and they tend to take things like birds and, and sometimes bats. We have owls that are are made to be up at night and see very well and be quietly hunting prey in the nighttime. And, and we have um, uh, larger hawks that are, that are built for catching things like rabbits and, um, and slower moving prey during the daytime. Um, we don't have any endangered species currently. We have two species that used to be endangered, the peregrine falcon and uh, bald eagle, but they're no longer on the endangered species list. Let's talk about an unusual bird that most, some people may never see in their life. They're around, but a barn owl. Let's talk about barn owls. 
Yeah, the barn owl is of great interest to us in Kentucky. They're what we call a species of greatest conservation need, and we spend a lot of time doing research on them. Um, we started paying close attention to them around 2009, and um, in 2010 we did a statewide inventory where we tried to find as many barn owls as we could in the state. And um, we were a little disappointed to find just 25 nesting pairs oh, statewide. Wow. And so we decided at that point in time to put a lot more effort into them, and we've kind of figured out over the past several years that the best thing we can do for barn owls in Kentucky is to ensure that each nesting pair of barn owls has a safe and permanent nest site. We found a lot of these barn owls in 2010 in areas where they were getting repeatedly disturbed, like um, grain silos or hollow trees that had been chopped down, um, places like that. So. We do travel the state putting up nest boxes for barn owls. Only in places where there are barn owls currently, we will put up nest boxes on private land. Um, we also have a study looking at um, contaminants in barn owls to see if that might be an issue for them. We feel that most of their decline was probably due to limited nest sites, but we're looking at other things for them too. And, and we find that our efforts are going pretty well. We did another inventory um, I guess it was in 2013, and we had 50 nesting pairs then. So we're going to keep keep working on the barn owl in Kentucky. And that brings to mind Wayne Bug, who just you kind of answered his question: How's the barn owl restoration project going? Why do they like barns? Are they actually well, is that one of their nesting sites that, more typically? Yeah, yeah. Historically, barn owls used hollow trees and rock shelters and caves, but. They are a, a relatively adaptable species and um, they like to hunt small rodents and, and farms are a good uh, population source for small rodents. So they'll end up nesting in, in barns and silos and just about anything close to good rodent populations. We found them in attics. We found them in um, like elevated hunting blinds, old chimneys. We found these owls in just the strangest places. And um, we really encourage folks if they have barn owls nesting on their property and they're not already um, talking with us about them. We'd love to know about those birds. Um, we're not going to come in and shut your farm down or anything just because you have barn owls. In fact, a big part of our project is to help um, people get their barn owls nesting in, in locations that are convenient for them. What kind of noise does a barn owl make? They make um, a really scary noise. They do not hoot. Um, they just screech. It sounds kind of like stepping on a cat's tail. Or Can you something. show? show I, you know, I'm not very good. Jeff, you're an educator, and by all rights, you should. You know, it sounds like a tea kettle heating up. Can you, That's the best can way you show I us? Describe, I, I, As I, an educator, it I think it's your responsibility. the hair on your neck. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. I know. I know the guy sitting on your hand. They kind of go. Yeah, yeah that's good. Something like that. That's very good. <laughs> he doesn't seem to be. Too alerted she, to she's probably had a lot of people do that at her over yeah. the years. What have you got in your hand? Uh, th this is an eastern screech owl. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, in my opinion, screech owl is, is a really bad name because they don't screech they don't at screech. all. They make the, very similar to what the noise that you just made. Uh, and eastern screech owls are the smallest owl of the, of the four species that we have in Kentucky year round. And uh, so, believe it or not, this is as big as she's ever going to get. Uh, she is full grown, but uh, despite the small stature, they're still impressive little hunters and they eat a lot of different things. Uh, when they're in season, so in the spring and the summertime, they eat a lot of uh, large insects, uh, moths, uh, cicadas, things like that. They'll also eat small rodents and they'll also occasionally uh, eat small songbirds. Why is it you see them on the road a lot in the summertime alongside the road? Because it well, unfortunately for raptors, roadsides along highways are, are good. Are well, it, it, it's it's a good area to find rodents because the uh, it's an edge area where typically grown-up area or forest meets a, a mowed area along the highway or in the median, and so uh, it's there's good opportunities for hunting there. But uh, unfortunately for a lot of raptors, it comes at a cost. That's that's also the same reason you see so many raptors dead in the road is because they tend to get tunnel vision. Uh, when they're going after a prey item, and, and that makes them very susceptible to getting hit by cars. And in fact, that is the exact reason that we have this owl at the Slato Center. Uh, she was hit by a car and uh, uh, deemed non-releasable because she suffered an eye injury. So she can still see, uh, but she can't see well enough to hunt anymore, and that's why we have her. Let's talk about the fact that they do get hit, and a lot of times they survive this. There are laws against taking these birds to your house, or, and, and real quickly tell us what those are. Exactly. In the, in the state of Kentucky, in order to take care of an, an injured or an orphaned uh, wildlife animal, you need to be licensed through the state. Uh, now, on our website, we list an entire list, uh, and you can even search by county, 
of licensed re wildlife rehabilitators that you can take any injured wildlife or orphan wildlife to. So I would always recommend that if you see a raptor that, that appears to be injured, whether it's near the road or even in your yard, it, it, there's clearly something wrong with it, uh, you can look on our website or, or give the 1-800 number a call and we can put you in touch with a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Okay, we've seen the smallest owl, and we know what kind of noise it makes, thanks to me. <laughs> because you won't tell us the answer. I'm sorry. But let's move up to the next notch. What's a, what's a little bigger owl? Well, we do have a couple of, I guess what we'd call medium-sized owls in the state. We have um, the barred owl, which would be the more common species, occurs statewide, and it's the one, here, I'll go ahead and give it a try, that says ah. out in the woods, who cooks for you? <laughs> that's all you're going to do? Yep, that's all yep. I got. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So this is what you hear out in the middle of the woods, a very um, boisterous, you know, hooting owl, uh, one of our more common birds. And then we also have a more rare owl that people don't often think about. It's the short-eared owl. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about the same size as a barred owl, but it likes grasslands, and it only shows up in the wintertime. It nests in Canada. You know, um, owls are interesting critters. You know, I made that noise right there, but during the spring when, and when they're getting together, they, they really have variations on that. They get really raucous and yeah. start making all kinds of crazy noises. Those barred which owls I'm are sure neat. Jeff is going to tell us what that sounds like when he gets back on the set with, with... This is a great horned owl. Well. And this is actually Kentucky's largest species of owls out of the four that we have here year-round. Uh, they're called a horned owl for pretty obvious reasons. Those those feather tufts on top of the head sort of resemble horns, and they're called the great horned owl because, again, of the size, and, and again, this is the largest of the species that we have here in Kentucky. Now, I understand that their diet includes skunks. It does, yeah. Great horned owls are, are what we consider apex predators, which means they're at the very top of the food chain. They don't have many natural predators to worry about themselves, and they are very impressive predators. They also eat smaller things. They'll eat rodents. Uh, mice, rats, squirrels, chipmunks, but then they'll also take larger prey items. And, and they are one of the only predators that we know of that will routinely kill and eat skunks. Are there olfactories not? That's exactly right. So most people squirm when you think of, of killing a, and eating a skunk because we know that when skunks feel threatened, they'll spray and it smells awful. But this is a great illustration of the, of the fact that except for vultures, birds have a really, really bad sense of smell. So if he were out in the wild and, and he caught a skunk and it sprayed, he really wouldn't care the way that you and I would care because he really couldn't smell the spray anyway. It's a good thing turkeys can't smell. You'd never, you'd never take one. <laughs> That's right. You know, uh, what, uh, what kind of noise do they make? They're, they're a, a traditional hoot owl. And uh, if you've ever been watching a, a movie or TV and you just, you just hear an owl kind of hooting, uh, not saying who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, it's probably a great horn owl. Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> Something like that. See? That's good. That's what I'm talking about. That I don't know that he was See, impressed. But I think he might have been. He went, ah. <laughs> A fellow owl. That, uh, you know, people would say, okay, that's pretty cool. You know, we're seeing this on TV. If, if they want to actually see this in action, if they wanted, where would they come to see something like this? Well, great horned owls are, are very, very common, out in the wild anyway. They're probably. I'm saying this of, particular owl. Oh, this and particular you. owl, yeah, uh, you, you would need to come to the Salado Wildlife Education Center. Every live bird that we're using today are birds that we have that are uh, all non releasable due to various injuries. And if you, if you want to get a, an up close look at these birds, you'll have to pay us a visit uh, when we're open for the season. What is the season roughly for? Uh, we're open. March through the day before Thanksgiving. We re reopen in, uh, always at the beginning of March. Gotcha. Uh, another question here. Linda S. Morrison wants to know, what has become of the peregrine falcons that nest on the Ironton Russell Bridge in Russell, Kentucky? That's a very specific question. It is specific. Um, well, the, the peregrine falcons on the Russell, Russell Ironton Bridge are doing okay. As I hear, uh, they've been nesting year after year there for over 10 years. But I guess we should talk a little bit about peregrine falcons in, in general, um, since we, we brought that up. Um, peregrine falcons are one of our species that used to be endangered in Kentucky, and they're still quite rare. They're no longer on the endangered species list, but we still monitor them closely. And um, we've got 13 nesting pairs statewide. Um, most of them occur on the Ohio River between Ironton and um, Louisville. We have quite a few nesting pairs in Louisville. And then we've got one pair um, in Frankfurt here, downtown. Wow. Yeah. Now, traditionally, they lived on cliff lines and things like that. They but, did, but they yeah. they find city living 
Why do they like the city? <laughs> well, um, peregrine falcons take avian prey. They, they eat mostly birds. And so um, city pigeons and starlings are a really good prey source for them. And um, although we're hoping to find more peregrine falcons in Kentucky on natural cliffs soon, our uh, urban areas are really out competing those natural areas just due to the, the prey densities. It's easier living there. And so they used to nest on cliffs, but nowadays they'll nest on high buildings, bridges, um, any sort of high structure that's close to a river. Over the years, Kentucky Field has covered a lot of the work that the department has done on the peregrine falcon, which includes banding. And, you know, you, you actually put cameras in and watch these critters do their everyday stuff. Let's talk about that. Yeah, well, we do ban peregrine falcons and several of our other rare um, uh, raptors, and, and that's basically a way to identify the indi individuals so that we can monitor their uh, survival and productivity. So when we um, ban peregrine falcons, we, we ban them with these uh, unique, they call them alphanumeric color bands, and so that's so we can look through a spotting scope and identify the individual years later. Um, we also occasionally ban uh, things like bald eagles, and you can see how much larger oh, yeah. this band is. Now, what is this? Is this aluminum or? Uh, yeah, the, the falcon ones are aluminum. The eagle ones are steel, just to, you know, for a stronger bird. Um, but uh, the the peregrine falcons actually, we have a webcam for them too, which is really neat. People should check out. It's online, and if you Google um, Kentucky uh, Peregrine Falcon webcam, you can watch the birds nest each year. What time of year do they mate? They start nesting in February, and uh, usually their young are learning to fly in May and June. Oh, wow. All right, what is a kestrel? A kestrel is a small falcon, um, a bit more common than the peregrine falcon. Uh, they, they spend a lot of time in our grassland and agricultural areas in Kentucky. And uh, I guess we've got one here on Jeff's hand. Was that good timing? That was perfect. <laughs> How did you do that? I'm just that good. Now, he has an obvious injury. I can see that he's, he's kind of like me. He's got a, he's got a injury. He, he's got a, yeah, his, his left wing, uh, the one that's drooping there, is broken. So mm -hmm. he, he's non-flighted. He can't fly anymore. So if you're a raptor that can't fly, then you can't catch food for yourself anymore. And, and you're definitely, especially if you're a small uh, raptor like a kestrel, you're definitely going to end up becoming food for, for something else. And so let's see if he'll want to take a little bit of food there. Kestrels, just like the screech owl, despite the small stature, uh, they're very impressive little hunters. And can by I the ask way, you that, what kind of noise he makes? <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he, he's gonna, like, by Why the way, that's what a kestrel sound, <laughs> sounds like. Yeah, uh, as he's eating right there, this is, this is a small mouse. Uh, just like with the screech owl, when they're in season, they will eat large insects like grasshoppers, cicadas, big bugs, occasionally earthworms or night crawlers if they could find them. But they also take small rodents like mice and voles, and occasionally they will take small songbirds. This, I like this guy. Me and him got something very, very much in common. He's loud and vocal, and, he, and, he's, and he's a carnivore. Yeah, now the really <laughs> neat thing about American kestrels is that all of the other raptors that we've been talking about, males and females are colored essentially identical. And we, we think of males and females being colored differently when we think about songbirds, where the male is typically more colorful. And that's the same uh, case with American kestrels. So see how he's got the really, really pretty bluish-gray color on his wings? The females actually don't have that. And, and kestrels are going to be found in, in open areas along fields and meadows. And, and a lot of times I see these guys perched on telephone poles or on actually electric wires, especially those that stretch out over, over a field and they're, and they're looking for rodents. If you get a good enough look, and, and our viewers that might have, have seen a kestrel before, if you get a good enough look and you see the blue on the wing, then you know that you're looking at a male. Uh, Robert Baker lives in Latonia, and he's seen a hawk swoop down in front of me several times and surprised it hadn't been... Uh, hit by a car. Well, he likes the mice, doesn't he? It's not, it's not as big as a red-tailed hawk, but how big is the Cooper's hawk and what is their diet? Well, a Cooper's hawk is in between the kestrel and the red-tailed hawk and um, probably about the, the size of a crow. And Cooper's hawks eat a lot of birds, but will also take some rodents. And you see them a lot of times visit your bird feeder. Yeah, yeah, it is oftentimes the hawk that shows up with the bird feeder. They're a fast flying hawk. Um, while we're still talking about kestrels, I thought I'd show something that uh, landowners- At first glance, it looks like a wood duck box, but- It does, and there's not a whole lot of a difference there, but the difference is where you put it. Mm -hmm. um, kestrels nest in cavities, and one of their 
uh, major problems is that um, there's not very many natural cavities anymore. And so to promote kestrels, uh, you can put up a kestrel nesting box. Um, this is best put in an area that's out in the country, away from um, places with a lot of house sparrows and starlings, perhaps up on a nice old tobacco barn How out in the middle of that? a hay field. And you need to put it up high for a kestrel, at least 15 feet high. The higher the better. Falcons like to be up, up high. Um, the nest box plans to build this are on our website. And um, I think if you Google Kentucky Kestrel Nest Box Plan, it's the first thing that comes up. But it's just a simple box, a really big bluebird style box. It's got a door in the top so that you can clean it out every once in a while. And um, this is the same style box that if you hang it down a little bit lower, maybe on a, a wood's edge, you might find an um, eastern screech owl using too. So can be a good way to help out your raptors. But you do need to, to keep an eye on these boxes when you put them up to make sure European starlings aren't taking them over because sometimes they can be, be a pest for nest boxes. Misty Witch lives near Brandenburg, Kentucky. There's a walking path there called the Buttermilk Falls. And there was a set of osprey there a few years ago. Uh, she doesn't see them anymore. Do they move from site to site or do they they usually stay in the same spot. It could be that the pair, you know, maybe one of them passed away, something happened, and the pair isn't there anymore. But osprey usually nest in the same site year after year. Okay, now let's bump it up a notch and let's talk about eagles. Now, when I was a kid, occasionally, my dad had an eagle eye, occasionally said, there's a bald eagle. And we'd get, you know, we'd look and we'd just be amazed that, you know, you'd see that white, vivid head and white tail. Um, that's not so unusual anymore. Why is that? It is becoming more and more common, and the eagle has just made a phenomenal comeback in our state and um, throughout the United States. Um, the decline of bald eagles uh, in the middle of part of the, the last century is mostly due to DDT, and um, the use of that pesticide caused their eggshells to become very thin, and for a while there was no eagle um, productivity. And so DDT was outlawed. Uh, the eagles were uh, reintroduced and also um, allowed to just naturally repopulate. And, and now they're doing great. And actually in Kentucky, we have over 130 nesting pairs statewide. Um, in the winter, eagles are migratory and we get a lot of birds that come down from uh, the Great Lakes region. And so we have more eagles in Kentucky in the winter than any other time. Um, so we're becoming a very good place to, to get out and look at eagles. Okay, Bobby Heron wants to know, what's a chicken hawk? I can tell him because I see him by my chickens all the time. Well, chicken hawk is a nickname for the red-tailed hawk, uh, which are very, very common here in Kentucky. And uh, it's, it's likely that most people, even if they didn't know what they were looking at, have seen a red-tailed hawk before. I see one. <laughs> so, how about that? No, I can't go anywhere with this glove anymore. I've just got red tails coming at me from all Do you know how many times here? this glove has brought to the end of the sea a shirt like this? Hey, when's the bird show? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so th this is the Salado Center's red-tailed hawk, uh, as you can see there. You, they, they're a good name for red tails. Uh, uh, we talked about how the screech owl is a bad name. Well, red-tailed hawk's a pretty good name for this hawk. They're one of the most common hawks in all of North America, and they're probably the most common hawk that we have here in Kentucky. And they're found all throughout the state and year-round. Um, does it ever bother you when you see an eagle flying on a movie and you hear red tail hawk sound? That is one of my biggest pet peeves, <laughs> and I'm kind of glad, glad you brought that up. Yeah, <laughs> apparently Hollywood wasn't too impressed with, with the noise that, that eagles make, and, and honestly, it's not nearly as impressive as, as the vocalization of a red tail. And no, I'm not going to do one for you. But <laughs> let me do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, something like pretty that. Good. Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. Yeah. You don't need to ask us to do these things. <laughs> and an eagle does more. Exactly. It's more uh -huh. of a, yeah, it's yeah. a, a screech of a powerful sound. Mm -hmm. Now, I can see he's got an eye missing. That's why he's Yeah, he, his, his right eye is actually still there, uh, but it's kind of shrunk, it's smaller and shrunken in and kind of weird looking, and it doesn't work, so he's blind in his right eye. Now, red tails, and I kind of want to go back to the, the chicken hawk. Chicken hog is really an unfair nickname for red tails because they've actually done research and found that chickens account for only about 10% of red tail hawk diet. Now you gotta feel bad for the poor grad students that had to follow these red tails around and look at what they were eating and, and, and uh, try to figure it out. But they're opportunists like most predators. If they live near a farm where there's chickens, sure they're gonna eat some chickens, but mostly uh, red tails eat small rodents. 
Uh, they eat a lot of mice, rats, chipmunks, squirrels, maybe a rabbit here and there. So yeah, the chicken hawk, it's, it's, it's I think, an, an undeserving nickname for a red-tailed hawk. Uh, that leads us to Kim Reed Collins' question, why can't we shoot a hawk? They keep beautiful birds from my home and they kill chickens. Well, f first of all, it's, it's important to know that, that all of the raptors are federally protected. Uh, and so you can't kill them, harm them, own them, or any part of them, including their feathers. Uh, that's the next thing I was going to ask. Nests if you find a feather, you can't necessarily that, that, that's have true. that. And, you know, and that apl the applies to songbirds as well. If you find a blue jay feather, it's actually uh, against federal law to, to possess that feather. And it's there to protect the birds. Uh, now, if she's concerned that they're eating the songbirds, uh, perhaps a cooper's hawk, or, or eating chickens, maybe a red-tailed hawk, it's important to know that they're just doing their job. Uh, they have a very important job to do, and, and they keep uh, the natural world balanced. They're designed to eat what they eat, and, and if they didn't eat what they eat, then we would have overpopulations of certain animals. Rodney Combs wants to know, do red-tailed hawks mate for life? They can if things are going well, uh, kind of like marriages in the human world. As long as things are going well, uh, they tend to mate for life. You know what? Uh, that was a very quick half hour. Thank you both for being on. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. We'll see you next week on Kentucky Field.